This is a true story that happened to me a long while ago when I was 10 years old. This story happened in a small town in the leafy suburbs north of New York City in Westchester County. It didn't happen at my house, but at the house of one of my good friends at the time, about a block away from where I live. This is one of those towns in Westchester where there are huge suburban houses set among oak and maple trees. It was a safe neighborhood where I knew the owners of each house by name. The houses were generally quite large, with multiple floors and several bedrooms. The house where this scary story takes place was extra large. It was not the shining hotel large, but it was a large colonial house with five bedrooms on the second level. The family living there had five children ranging from 10 to the upper teenage years at that time. The night this happened was a dark, cold night. The parents were out with dinner plans that evening, and I was there visiting my friend Byron, who was also 10, and his older brother Jacob, who was 12. It was just the three of us in a large house on a dark night during October. I knew this family quite well, so I felt very at home in their home. We were just goofing around that night playing some games and watching TV. Three kids in a large empty house, so this is where the night becomes creepy. The three of us were in the kitchen with the lights on bright. It was around 11.30 at night, so it was late but not super late. The phone rang, and Jacob, acting as the head of the household at 12 years old, answered, Hello. We then saw Jacob get a peculiar look on his face and he hesitantly said, Just a minute, and then did something a bit odd. He rested the phone down on a chair. This was one of those wall phones from the 1990s. I don't think people still use those. In any case, he put the phone down and just left it and walked upstairs. I remember thinking it was a strange thing to do, but there could still be a reasonable explanation. I looked at Byron and he also had a curious WTF type of expression on his face. We were quiet for a few seconds, and both our facial expressions showed signs that we thought this was peculiar and odd. Here's what happened upstairs. Jacob climbed the stairs and went into his parents' room, where there is a tabletop telephone. This is one of those old corded phones where you pick up the receiver and hold it to your ear. Jacob picked the phone up and said, Okay, I'm upstairs, what's up? A few moments went by with dead silence and Jacob asked, Hello? Then the voice came. It was calm but cold. Jacob, there's a bomb inside your house and it's going to blow any second now. The other end had hung up. He dropped the phone and felt panic rush through his body. He ran out of the bedroom, down the stairs, and started screaming, Get out of the house. There's a bomb in the house. There's a bomb in the house. We saw Jacob at the bottom of the stairs running, and he did not waste any time heading straight through the foyer, outside, and down the stone path that leads away from the house and out to the street. Byron and I ran with confused fury as well. Jacob stopped running when he arrived on the other side of the street on the sidewalk. We looked across the street at this huge house looking very eerie on the dark night. The house had several lights on, the front door was open, and it was empty. There was no one around. The neighborhood was still and quiet. It was just us, three kids, the oldest 12 years old, standing there on a cold October night at almost midnight, scared out of our wits and waiting for the house to burst into fire. I was feeling chills through my body and on my skin from the cold, dark air. Our jackets were just in there and we could just go get them so easily, but we thought the house could blow up at any second. Jacob explained what had happened on the phone call upstairs and that he thought it was his Uncle Jerry, but now he didn't think it was his Uncle Jerry. It was bizarre that the caller knew he answered on the ground floor and told him to go upstairs. How could he know this? We thought that maybe he told Jacob to go upstairs so that he wouldn't have enough time to get out of the house before the possible explosion. We stood there. We waited. We were scared. We were cold. We thought the large, boxy, empty, illuminated house on this dark night would soon be in flames. Or that there was a chance it would be in flames. It never blew up. But we were still afraid to go inside because maybe it would blow up then. Eventually, we went to the neighbor's house. The father there didn't seem as scared as we were, but he did call the police. The police searched through the house, and Byron and Jacob's parents also arrived home. The whole thing was some kind of practical joke, a prank call, and there was never a bomb. We never found out who made the call, and Jacob to this day still has no idea who it could have been, and still says that he, at first, thought it was a friendly call from their uncle. There are a few pranksters in the neighborhood. Actually, we were among the biggest pranksters in the neighborhood. Still, that doesn't explain how the caller knew Jacob was on the downstairs phone and that there was another telephone upstairs. And further, 
it seems like the caller knew who he was speaking to. Who would do such a prank that is so sinister to a few vulnerable kids home alone on such a night? From the time I was 12 until I was 18, my mom lived in a two-story apartment. I lived with and was raised by my grandparents, but I spent a great deal of time staying with my mother, so both places were equally home for me. For the entire six years that she lived there, my mother received sporadic phone calls from an unknown caller that we both came to call the Hello Man. The reason for this is fairly simple. When he called, he would say hello several times in a monotonous voice with a short, evenly timed pause between each utterance. The only time he ever called was when no one happened to be there, so each call was recorded on the answering machine. Each time the call was made from a blocked number or a public place, and it goes without saying that it wasn't a voice we recognized. The first few times we wrote it off as being a wrong number or a prank. It wasn't exactly threatening in any way, and it wasn't even unsettling to us either. For the entire six years we would receive these calls. Sometimes weeks or months would pass before we'd find another one of these messages on the answering machine. After a few years, when we became completely certain that it wasn't someone we knew, we still didn't find any harm in them. Irritating to come home on a bad day when you were already in a bad mood, but nothing more. It even became a bit of a running joke in the family, weaving into the idle comments that made up our days and small talk between one another. In all the years we received the calls, the messages were always the same, and no other contact was made between this person and us. About two years before she eventually moved out, for unrelated reasons, my mother had her number changed, again for unrelated reasons. Several weeks after doing so, a new message from the hello man was left. The context of the call was the same, hello, hello, hello. But for the first time the tone and pacing were different. There was barely a pause between each word and he was louder, almost panicked in the way he spoke. Later that week a second message was left. This one sounded angry and he said hello just a single time. For the first time we felt a little threatened by the caller. How had he gotten her new number? You'd think this would be more reason for us to suspect a friend or family member, but it only made us more sure that it wasn't. No one we knew would take a prank far enough to make us feel a legitimate threat, no matter how small. The small sense of fear disappeared quickly, however. It was weeks before we received another call, and when we did, it was back to the same monotone and slow repetition as before. In fact, after this point, the calls came even more infrequently than before, and we all but forgot about the hello man in the times between. At the end of those six years, three years ago now, I was staying with my mom nearly full time to help her pack up and organize. Due to some various personal issues, she would be putting most of her belongings in storage to stay with us, my grandparents, my siblings, and I, for a short time before finding a new place for herself. On one particular night, when it was just me and my mother spending the night at her now nearly barren apartment, we received the last call from the hello man. An actual call while we were there, not a message left for us to find hours or even just minutes later. At the time, we'd been taking a break and watching a movie which was just the reason we'd still kept the couch, TV, and DVD player at the apartment. Hello, hello, I know you're there this time. Hello. There was a long pause during which we heard nothing, not even the sound of his breath. Then, just as the answering machine was about to cut off his message, he started quoting a line from the movie that had been said just a few minutes before. The machine beeped and cut him off, but he didn't call back. Needless to say, we called my grandfather to come pick us up because we didn't want to spend the night there any longer. So, I currently attend college in a major city in the United States. It's a lovely place with tons of fun things to do. However, it has one big downside. It's a major human trafficking hub, one of the biggest in the nation. For me, a teenage girl, this means that I have to be especially careful. My parents gave me the whole safety talk before I moved out. Never go out into the city alone, especially at night. For my first eight months on campus, nothing too concerning happened, save for a few cat callers and the particularly inappropriate behavior of one homeless man as I ran by him during a workout. However, when I returned to campus after spring break, I had one of the most anxiety-inducing experiences of my life. 
I had visited my parents over spring break and taken a bus back. It was a lot cheaper than airfare, and my cat didn't handle flying well. I'd visited home a few times, and usually I'd had no problems getting from the bus station to my dorm when I got back to the city. I'd call a ride from an app and be home in 10 minutes or so. My bus got in around 9, so it was already dark outside. I'm not sure what happened, but for some reason, the GPS on the ride-sharing app must have messed up my location. Four different drivers missed the turn to find me and ended up canceling the ride. After 30 minutes of waiting, now on the fifth driver, I finally called to tell her exactly where I was outside the station, so there wouldn't be any confusion. She said she was on her way, so I stood on the curb and waited. I had headphones on, but wasn't playing any music. This was my way of preventing people from approaching me, but also allowing me to hear and be aware of my surroundings. Boy, I'm glad I did that. After about two minutes of standing on the curb, a man walks directly behind me, stops and leans up against a wall. At first, I'm only mildly wary of the man. I feel the vague sensation that he's watching me, but try not to get too paranoid. After feeling like the staring is continuing, I text my boyfriend to let him know what's going on, just in case. The man pulls out a flip phone and makes a call. I feel a bit less nervous, until I hear the conversation. I'm not sure who he was talking to on the call, but the man was describing details of my appearance into the phone. I hear snippets like, she's tall, maybe 5'8", red hair, yeah yeah, she's young, she's pretty. I try not to show any sign that I'm hearing all this. My headphones are still on, so I figure he thinks I'm clueless. I check my phone to see where my ride is. She's stuck at an intersection about a half mile away. I'm not sure what I should do at this point. I couldn't just start running because I still had my bag and cat carrier. I decide to call my driver again and ask her if I can stay on the line with her until she gets here. I can tell she's a little confused, but I didn't want to go into detail. If this guy was trouble, I wanted to make sure he didn't do anything sudden if he realized I'd caught on to him. However, I didn't want to call the police because I didn't think I had enough to report him yet. I also didn't want to walk anywhere else because the surrounding area wasn't lit as well as where I was already standing. For some of you, this may not sound like the scariest experience. For me, however, being alone at night in a big city with a human trafficking problem and suddenly having a strange man stare at me and call to tell someone what I look like in creepy detail, it scared me. Big time. He hung up his phone after a few minutes and thank God my ride got there about a minute later. I'm not sure I want to know what would have happened if that driver had cancelled on me too.